Welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church. My name is Robert Gurrell and I'm the senior minister here. We're so glad you're worshiping with us today. Just a couple of brief announcements for you. Tonight we have youth at 5.30 and we also have confirmation at 5.30 and we look forward to seeing all of our young people. On Wednesday night we have our Logos program for children and youth and uh, that's a great event along with choir practice and uh, all of our regular Wednesday night activities. Take uh, time to look forward to Holy Week and plan to be a part of our Maundy Thursday and Good Friday services and of course Easter. We hope you'll invite a friend. We hope those of you who watch online will invite friends to watch with you as well. Again, thank you so much for worshiping with us today at Centenary. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, Centenary family, those of you here in the sanctuary, those of you watching online, and of course we have our brothers and sisters across the hall at the Contemporary Service worshiping with us as well today. It's a blessing to welcome all of you. Uh, I love a story I heard, I was reminded of recently about a pastor who just finished a funeral service. The, the casket had been opened and he preached about what a great guy the person was who had died. After the service, he thaw, saw three of his uh, little lost wandering lambs, and he said, I'd like to talk to you three guys for a minute, and he set them down on the front row right next to the casket, and he said, you know, a few minutes ago, you were sitting in this funeral, and the casket was open, and I was talking about your friend Joe, and I want to ask the three of you, you guys haven't been in church lately, I've been really worried about you, I just want to put this on you now, what do you want people to say on the day you die? When you're in that casket and they're looking at you, what do you want people to say? And the first guy felt real guilty and he said, well, I, I, just, I hope they'll say he was, he was a recovered Christian. You know, he, he got messed up, but he turned his life around. And the second guy had time to think about it. He said, well, I, I hope they'd say he was a, he was a great husband and, and, a, and, a, and a great friend. And the third guy looked the pastor straight in the eye and said, I hope they'll say, look, he's moving. <laughs> Well, this is the season of both accountability and resurrection. So those are kind of the two themes that we work with all of this season right up and through Easter. And we're so glad that you're here to be a part of it as we do that. And I want to do something a little bit different today. I want to talk about the end of the service. We talk about lots of times various things that happen in the service. I want to mention the end of the service. Uh, every Sunday in all of our services, there's a call to discipleship that comes after the sermon. And that's a time when you, in which you are invited to respond. And there are different ways you can do that. Uh, if you're not a member of this congregation and you'd like to join the church, you come up during that last hymn and you can join the church. And uh, if you're already a baptized member of another church, you've been a Christian, you know, sometime in your life, you don't have to be rebaptized in the Methodist church. You simply come by transfer, and we recognize your faith walk from whatever denomination you came from before. If you've never been baptized, then we can do that as well. And in the Methodist Church, 
Uh, we believe that baptism is in the heart. It's your relationship with Jesus Christ. And we symbolize that with water. Uh, we can use a little bit of water or a lot of water. Uh, sometimes people will ask my staff members, does Robert sprinkle, pour, or immerse? And they say yes. And usually all at once, because I have these big hands. But uh, it's a very simple service. You come forward, we use a, a water to symbolize what's happened in your heart. Of course, you can always come with a prayer need. If something's going on in your life and you feel like you need extra prayer, the prayers of the church, just come up during that last hymn. You can share that with any of the pastors and we'll invite the congregation to pray for that need in your life. And in this season of Lent, like those guys sitting, the pastor sat down at the end of the funeral, oh, this is a time to take stock of where you are as a Christian. And it may be that what you need to do in this season is recommit your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe, uh, maybe there's things you need to change and, and you want to strengthen that relationship with Christ. And you come forward and we simply renew your vows and you make a recommitment to Jesus Christ. All those things are available to you at the end of the service during the call to discipleship. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Let's unite our hearts and praise Jesus. Let's stand for the choral call to worship. <laughs> As we enter the wilderness of Lent, we rest in the shelter of the Most High. We abide in the shadow of the Almighty. We find refuge in the wings of our holy God. We trust that the angels of God, the words of God, the people of God, and the hands of God will somehow bear us up. Please join us in the hymnal, Love Divine, All Its Fruit, etc. <laughs> Oh, 
please join along in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you're overwhelming in your power and your strength and your might. And yet you see us as tender and helpless lambs. You seek us wherever we go. And when we are lost, you never give up until we are found. Lord God, make us more like the shepherd in Jesus' story. Give us a heart and a passion for those who seem or feel lost. Forgive us, Lord, that sometimes we are only concerned about the comfort of where we are in the flock. As long as we're safe and warm and protected, we think the world is okay and everything is all right. But war has come again and reminded us that we are vulnerable and frail, and at any time the world can be turned completely upside down. Lord God, help us to have hearts of compassion for those who suffer and struggle, and especially in these days, for those who are the victims of war and violence. So many times in scripture, you tell us the stories of people who rose up and abused their power, who harmed the weak and the innocent, and we see the same thing happening now. And sometimes it's even in the name of our religion. Forgive us, O oh Lord, if we despair and if we feel like we're immobilized and cannot do anything. Stir our hearts, but just as importantly, stir our feet and our hands and our voices, that we will speak up when we see wrong, that we'll stand up to those who abuse power, that we'll take ourselves and go to where there is a need, where there is pain, and where there is brokenness. The buildings in Ukraine today, the church buildings are broken, many of them, smashed and crushed by bombs. But the church there is resilient and people are worshiping this morning and praising you. And we join them too. Sometimes our world feels crushed and broken, but we can be resilient in you 
for you strengthen us, you guide us, and you are our light, even in the darkness. And so we praise for the full confidence of your little lambs, this prayer that our shepherd taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's a beautiful Sunday morning. Please get up and uh, greet your neighbor. Pass the peace. Hi, my name is Chuck Absher, and I've been a member here at Centenary for uh, many years, 25 plus uh, at least. Uh, and uh, I'd like to share with you a little bit today. Uh, when I was young, I did go to church a little bit, uh, kind of strayed like many people when I was a young adult. Came back to the church when uh, I was kind of in some financial problems and business problems and, uh, you know, seeking it probably for the wrong reasons. Uh, baptized and strayed again uh, through my wife praying for me in some some rocky areas uh, in my life uh, one day I decided on a Sunday morning uh, they were getting ready her and the kids and and uh, she said what are you doing and I said well I'm gonna go to church with you today and it kind of shocked her came to church that morning and uh, wondered about people looking at me why was I here uh, we had a pretty large attendance at that time. Lynn Brock came up to me in the sanctuary, shook, shook my hand, said, Chuck, I'm so glad you're here, and put his hand on my shoulder, and I melted. It was like Jesus Christ saying to me, your sins are forgiven, come walk with me. And I did, and uh, that's where my faith journey started. I started getting involved uh, with, in Sunday school, Logos, a uh, few other things. Uh, the crosses behind me, that was a Logos project that I headed with some kids and we made those. And uh, hopefully when they come in this church, uh, maybe after they've wandered, that that'll mean something to them. It means something to me every time I see them. Uh, got involved, uh, I was challenged by my pastors and uh, my mentors, uh, the new mentors that I had in Christian uh, area of life, I was challenged to do things that I didn't think I was equipped for and uh, did them and succeeded and went on to some other things. In my Christian life, I, uh, it's not all rosy. 
I uh, stumble at times, I stumble many times. Uh, I, uh, I'm trying to achieve, I'm trying to get better. I know that uh, what I do uh, in my Christian walk, I know that it doesn't matter that I'm, I am forgiven, uh, but I'm constantly trying to uh, help others and uh, to be a witness with uh, the Word. Uh, I'm now in a small group. Uh, a fantastic small group. We can get in there and we let go. We uh, talk about our lies. We talk about our stumbles. We talk about our victories and we talk about our failures. Uh, it is uh, something that I look forward to every week. One of the things that uh, we talk about in our small group is how to be a witness uh, to others. Uh, we all feel like we uh, fall short in that area and we are always striving to do better in that area. Uh, I still remember that day when Lynn Brock came up to me and said, Chuck, you're welcome here. And that's what I strive for is to welcome others. As we prepare our hearts for offering, will you pray with me? Dear God, Thank you so much for this beautiful day. We ask that you please continue to lift up and be with all those who are in need of healing. We want to thank you so much for your always ever presence and grace and for allowing us to have the peace of mind to know that no matter how turbulent and chaotic our world seems to be, everything's going to be okay. In your name we pray.
Let us pray. Almighty and holy God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. We do believe. Let us burn brightly and be a light in the darkness. Amen. One of my most precious and earliest memories actually takes place at church. My mother had taught the two- and three-year-old class for many, many years. She had longed to have a child of her own in that class, but she and my father had been unsuccessful. They tried for 10 years without having children, and she had watched other young couples have children, start their families, and she had helped raise their children. And then finally, she had one of her own. And I was in her class at last, And it was the story of the lost lamb, and she was pulling out all the stops. It was a different era back then. There there wasn't anything digital she could do. She couldn't couldn't pull up the internet or, or a DVD or anything like that. But what she had us do, she had cut little lambs out of foam rubber. You know, the stuff you you, you pack to protect things that's kind of squishy and soft. She had cut little lambs out of foam rubber, and we painted little faces on them, you know, as the best a two-year-old and a three-year-old can paint. And then we were allowed to use the glue to attach cotton balls to our lambs. Now, how cute is that? (laughs) Right? Yeah, my mom was pulling out the stops. And that's the first memory I have of church, is that it's soft and warm and safe. Because that's what my mama told me. That's why this is my favorite chapter of the Bible, I think. There are three stories in the 15th chapter of Luke, all about things being lost and found. First a lamb, then a coin, and then a child. When they're all lifted up, when they're all finally found, in each story there is great rejoicing. You know that feeling of losing something and finding it? I can think of a time I lost my wedding ring and after much searching found it before my wife knew. That's rejoicing. (laughs) Right? In these stories, it, it, it... it talks about um, the joy that God has in finding the lost. I think that that is something we're supposed to get hold of in these stories and feel as well. Now, we always talk about the prodigal son story. Today, I want to talk about the first story of the lost lamb. And and it reminds me very much of a friend of mine who is a pastor. He's just an exceptional guy. He's one of those guys that no matter what he gets into, he turns it into just an incredible success. He, he married the girl that, that lived across the street, and they've had a beautiful, wonderful marriage for many decades. They had two sons, and the boys were those kind of kids that are just great achievers. You know, Whatever they did, they just did it extremely well, whether it was academics or sports or music. They were just tremendous at that. And, and he's the kind of pastor, well, I'd want him to be my pastor. I'll just put it that way. And they had this idyllic kind of a life, which is what we all look for in America, right? A a life where where everything is safe and secure and and happy. And no matter how bad things are in the world, as long as 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 our little flock is safe and secure, we, we feel happy. And then my friend and his wife did something no one understood. There was a girl who was up for adoption. As a child, she had been sexually molested. She had a burning drug addiction. No one wanted her. I've been a caseworker. Nobody comes to see the caseworker to ask for that child. Nobody. But my friend and his wife, they adopted Mary. And they they brought Mary into their home. And, And I can remember people in our circle talking about that, other pastors talking about What do they think they're doing? They had everything great. Everything was comfortable and fine and safe and on track. What do they think they're doing? And they loved Mary. And they took care of her. 
and they, they walked the road that she walked, which was a road of pain and lostness. And at 14 years old, she died of a drug overdose. And again, I, I remember those same circles talking and saying, what did they think was going to happen? Surely they knew this is how it would end. Why did they ever get into this? In fact, the, the bishop we had at the time went to my friend and said, now don't, don't say anything in front of your congregation. Church members don't want to see the pastor struggling emotionally, so don't, don't say anything. So the next Sunday he would have told everybody everything, but good man. And I always admire what he did at the funeral. Because everybody had these questions, you know, why had they done this? What, what was the deal, you know? Were they so sorry that they ever took Mary in? And, and my friend got up at, at, at her service, at Mary's service, and he said, you know, I know a lot of you are wondering about this. We didn't ever think we could fix Mary or make Mary perfect. That wasn't our job. Our job was to love the child that nobody else but God loved. And if God loved her, then we could love her too. He said, you probably are thinking that we just gave and gave to this child and didn't get anything in return, but you'd be wrong if you think that. He said, because every day with Mary was an adventure. Every day when, when something good finally happened in her life, it was amazing to see that. She had never experienced love when we loved her. She didn't even trust it or believe it at first. She thought we were working an angle in her life. And to see her learn and discover what unconditional love was about, that was incredible. And he said, you know, we learn from her. We learn from Mary how precious life is. We learn from Mary that, that sometimes things are so hard that you've got to fight for joy and happiness. You've got to fight for it and claim it and make it your own. We learn patience from Mary. We learn compassion from Mary. We learn to laugh through your tears from Mary. We learn to love better and bigger and stronger and more deeply than we thought possible because that's what Mary taught us. That's what it means to love someone that only God can love. My dear friend John Holbert, who's a biblical scholar, used to say, and still does, I guess, that Jesus was crucified because of bad table manners, right? Go tell that to your friends in other denominations uh, this week, right? Because he was always eating with the wrong people. Now, that's a little hard for us to get hold of in our culture when you'll go to the Golden Corral and sit down next to anybody and gobble down 12 ribs or something, right? You, you, that, that's different for us. But in that culture, and still true in the Middle East today, who you eat with is a big deal. When you eat with someone, when you break bread with them, you're saying, you're my family. I'll die for you. I always make sure when I take a group to the Middle East that I make the tour guides eat with us. Because then I know the tour guides will die for us if we're in a bad situation. Right? That, and it also means you are my equal. It's a kind of intimate act shared only by people who care deeply for one another, and we reenact it every time we do communion. That's, that's part of the, the foundation of what that meal is about. That's why Jesus brought his most beloved friends to the upper room. We'll talk all about that on Monday, Thursday. So it's a powerful thing. So Jesus was eating with people who were unsavory, right? They were on the wrong list. They weren't being invited to the red carpet at the Oscars or the Grammys. 
They were that, that person that, that I see when I'm driving down the street and I'm in my nice car and, it, and I have the air conditioning on. It's 104 degrees outside, but I don't care because I'm cool and I'm listening to a great stereo on, on my expensive phone and I see the guy over there who's, who's waddling down the street and can hardly walk straight. And so I swerve to avoid him. Jesus was eating with those people. He was saying, you're my family. We're close. I'll die for you. And he goes on and does it. And the Pharisees and the scribes, the clergy bill, the attorneys, the people of power and wisdom, the politicians, didn't like it. You ever start eating with sinners and somebody's going to get uncomfortable and complain. And they, they, they say, here's a holy man. You know, he's a rabbi, he's a teacher, maybe a country preacher, you know, just from not back up north, but they're not even hardly really Jewish, but anyway. And he's eating with sinners. And, and, and he represents God, and here's the catch. He represents God. So, so if, if he, the rabbi, sits down and eats with these people, ooh, the worst of the worst. Prostitutes and tax collectors. One of my best friends works for the IRS. I always like to give him a little nudge in this story. Right? The tax collectors. If he eats with them, then what he's saying is, what that symbolizes is, that God loves them too. And we all know that's not Possible. We all know God can't feel that way, right? I think someday scientists are going to discover that we have a little gland somewhere in here. One of you doctors will figure it out. Maybe, maybe when you do my autopsy, I'll, I'll go ahead and let you do that so you can find that gland. And, and that gland somehow affects us and we rank people. We just walk into a room, we do it automatically. It's, it's just natural. We don't even think about, oh, they're above me, they're a little bit above me, they're about like me, they're below me, they're way below me. Right? That's who we are. Somehow that makes us feel better about our place in the world. And so these guys are looking at Jesus, the holy man, and they're seeing who he's sitting with, who he's feeding, who he's adopting, 14-year-old drug addict. And it makes them uncomfortable. Because if God and God's representatives do that, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm supposed to do that too. Maybe when I go in the school cafeteria and there's that one kid that everybody knows nobody sits with, maybe, maybe I'm supposed to go have lunch with him today. And that makes me very uncomfortable. Now the Bible teaches in two different methods. So you educators out there, you, you, know, you probably recognize this. It teaches in, in two different methods. For, for people who are, are very, um, I don't think of the best way, dumb, who are very dumb, right? It, it just gives you a rule. Here's the rule, go follow this rule till the day you fall over dead and you'll be okay, right? So you get that in the Bible sometimes. But then for people who are wise and brilliant and deep thinkers and create, like you people, right? Then th th you just tell a story. Because wise, brilliant, deep thinkers, creative people like you, you'll figure it out for yourselves. And so Jesus said, wait a minute, let me just tell you a story. Let me just tell you a story. There was a flock of lambs. They got their cue. You guys did it perfect. God, that's like one of the greatest moments in preaching right there. I'm glad Kevin got that on video, right? Were, now, don't do it anymore. That's good. You, you had your moment. Now, now we're done, right? So there were a flock of lambs, and, and one of them got lost. And the shepherd goes to look for that lamb. And, and he leaves the 99 behind to do it, and he goes out to find that one lost lamb. And, 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 and it's the weird Jesus math that doesn't apply anywhere else. I got a degree in statistics. We never learned a formula in statistics like this. You risk the 99 to go and claim the one, right? It's bad math. It's bad management. If you take a management course, they're not going to tell you to do that. You know, if you got 100 
and you can get 99 home, you've done a good job. And what a lot of people miss in this story all the time, we miss it, is we think, as we think about this story, okay, there's the 99, they're in the pen where the wolves can't come get them, they're safe and protected, and, and so that, they're, they're okay, and he's just going to go find this. That's not what the story says at all. Read the story. The lambs are left in the wilderness where the thieves come and the wolves come and the terror of the world can tear them apart. Tear them apart. Tear you and me apart. And the shepherd thinks if they can just stay together in the flock, they can survive. Remember that, the, remember that the next time you're thinking about whether I need to go to church today or not. What is Jesus' plan for the church? That you be a flock in the wilderness, that you cling together, that you console and protect one another. That's what it is. Nothing less. So he leaves the 99 in the wilderness, hoping that somehow they'll band together and survive. And he goes out to seek the lost he goes out to find it. And finally he finds it, and he brings it not to the safety of the pen. <laughs> not Jesus. He just throws it in with the other sheep that are out there in the wilderness. Now when we go to Israel, and some of you in here have been there, we, we like to go down to a shepherd's field, so you can, and a, and a nice shepherd will come up, a nice Palestinian shepherd will come up and bring a lamb for $5, you can get your picture made with a lamb in the shepherd's field where the angels once sang, right? And, but if you pay attention to where you are, you're in the place between the, the cannons and, and the mortars and against the fence that separates the Palestinian area from the Jewish areas, it, it's all, that's where they take care of the sheep. The sheep are always in the wilderness. They're always just a shepherd away from annihilation. And that's just the reality of the world in which we live. Now, if you follow the story carefully and, 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 you, and you take a little time to learn Koinonia Greek, which is the ancient Greek of the, the, the New Testament that Luke wrote in, I hope you'll do that this afternoon, then you start to find out what Luke is really saying here. First, he's saying that, that every sheep matters. Secondly, he's saying that, and this is the hard part for me, that we're all lambs in the wilderness. See, I was, when I first read this story for the, most of my life, I read this as, I'm in the flock, I'm safe, I'm secure, and God help those lambs that wander astray. And I should have known better because there, there's a picture. If, if you go into Cracker Barrel today for lunch, I recommend the fried chicken. If you go in there today, there's a picture up on the wall of a lost lamb. And when I was a, a little kid, I started having nightmares and couldn't sleep at night. I was afraid something was out there trying to get me. And so my granddad got a picture just like that one hanging in Cracker Barrel. And, and he brought it and he hung it by where I slept. And it's a picture of a lamb lost in a blizzard. I don't think they have blizzards in Israel. It snows about once every 20 years. Not blizzards, but this is a blizzard. And there's one little baby lamb lost in the blizzard. And there's a sheepdog who has risked his life to go out and find that lamb. His footsteps you can see in the deep, deep snow, and he's come to that little lost lamb, and he's crying out for the shepherd to come. And my granddad told me, he said, that's the way we all are. We're all lost lambs. And Jesus is like that dog. He will go through whatever it takes to come and find us. And he'll never stop. And he draws the heart of God and God's love to us. He's so Junior, he would say, you don't ever have to be afraid. Even in the dark, Jesus is there, just like that sheepdog. So I should have known what Luke was saying, that we're all lost lambs. We're 
We're all out there in the wilderness. We're all struggling. We're all that equality around the table as Jesus reinforced time and again when he ate with sinners. We're all the same. In fact, Luke will, will, will remind us of that in just a moment. First, he, he talks about being lost. And in the Koine Greek that you're going to learn this afternoon before dinner, you will discover that that, that word in Greek, in the Greek of the New Testament, doesn't just mean it's misplaced, you, know, you can't find it. It means that something has been devastated. If you don't know what that means, turn on one of the news channels this afternoon and look at some of those cities in the Ukraine. They've been devastated. Wiped off the face of the planet. The word that Luke uses to describe loss and being lost is a word for ultimate destruction. To be crushed and broken, and some of you already know what I'm talking about. Right? And so when the shepherd goes out, he doesn't go out, and, you know, you, sometimes you hear this story, the lamb has value, you know, and you're going to go out and find that lamb. That's not what it's about. The shepherd goes out to find the one who is broken, crushed, and devastated, and bring them home. Sometimes you hear the story talked about, and they say, well, it's kind of a math thing. You probably really should have left the, you kept the 99, let the one go. But that's not the way shepherding worked in Palestine in Jesus' day. If you can imagine, we were, we were all a, a little Palestinian village. And each one of us had a couple of lambs that kept our family in wool and alive. But most of us didn't know much about lambs. So we would select maybe Greg, who knows a lot about lambs, and we would give him all of our lambs to take care of. And Greg would know as the shepherd that if he lost one of those lambs, he, would, he might be losing Robert's lamb, right? A Wesley Sue's lamb, or Mike's lamb. So those lambs belonged to somebody, and that's what we forget in the world we live in. When we look at other people and think of them as less than, that is somebody's lamb. Everybody is somebody's lamb. So when the shepherd brings the lamb back, there is great rejoicing. Because when it's your lamb that's lost, and they finally are returned to you, there's a great celebration. I only have a small feeling of that. I lost my wedding ring once, and I was able to find it before my wife knew that I had lost it. That was a rejoicing moment. It's nothing compared to this. Some of you have lost lambs. Some of you have been lost lambs. Some of you are lost lambs. In fact, Luke says, not only is there rejoicing on earth, there is rejoicing in heaven. God stops everything turns off all the big screen TVs, shuts down the pool in heaven, closes all the spas and said, we got to get together and celebrate. Another lost lamb has been found. And then Luke says, lest we think that, you know, God is soft on crime, would never get elected in Oklahoma, unless we think that, then Luke says, because when a sinner repents, there's celebration. And, and the word repent, in, in, in Koinonia Greek, he, he uses seven times just in this little passage, this little 15th chapter of Luke. It means something different. When we think of repent in the modern church, because of what we did to ourselves, I think, in the Middle Ages, we think of this sense of heaviness and burden and, uh, and, 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 and being to have to be contrite and really, really sad and sorry for what we've done. That's not what it meant in the beginnings of the church. The word repent in, in Koinonia Greek, the Greek of the, of the first church, is a word that means to see the world differently. To open up your eyes and see the world in a way you've never seen it before. And when you do that, how can you do anything but celebrate? It's Mary, who had never known love, experiencing and learning what love is and what unconditional love is. That's repentance. 
in the biblical sense. It's to see the world differently, to know that God is love. And every lamb belongs to God. To be able to take this story and apply it in your own life is what I call the rule of one. It's, it's, it's always going after the one that's left behind, left out, uh, unmentionable, seems unworthy, the one who's broken, the one who's hurting, the, the one who takes the most risk out of your life to reach out to. That's the rule of one, and it's the only way I know to live in this world of hardness and violence and brutality and sadness and stay sane. The rule of one. To always go beyond where you are right now and risk yourself and reach out and try to make a difference in at least one lost lamb's life. And thereby find your own self. Because Jesus says that we all need to repent. We're all in the same boat as that lost lamb. We're all in the wilderness. We all have to recognize our lost lambedness. You like that lost lambedness? I made that up. It's really good, I think. Right? We have to know that about ourselves. And once you know that about yourself, then reaching out to other lost lambs becomes incredibly easier to do. One of my best friends is a friend named, is a, is a friend named Donna. And I always tease her that um, she, uh, she was my first secretary. She was 15 and volunteered at church then. But I always claim her as my first secretary. And we've been friends for, for decades now. And she keeps our group of friends together. She's that one person that, you know, calls everybody and says, let's all get together. Let's hang out and stuff. She's so good at that. And, uh, and we share another, we share a lot of things in common. One of the great things we share in common is we're both step-parents. And so over the years, uh, we've had a lot of moments when we could talk to each other about stuff that our spouses could not understand, who are both natural parents, you know. And, and I, I don't know, if, if you do step parenting, maybe this is true in biological parenting, but I can tell you in, in step parenting, you learn to love the lost lamb. You learn to love without expectation of being loved in return, or you'll be miserable at step parenting. You have to learn that. So we've supported each other in that journey. And, and she's this amazing person, and she... All day long, she works for security in a big corporation. And, and, and all day long, you know, her job is about catching bad guys and, you know, making sure they go to jail and things like that. Her, her phone rings. She's on call. She has to work weekends and nights. and do it. She even has Lawton as part of her region where she works sometimes. And, uh, and, and that's her job. That's her life. That's her world, right? Making sure justice is served. And I'm thankful that she does that job uh, so the people I love and care about Aren't, uh, aren't threatened or maybe hurt by people who are not so nice in the world. But that's not all of Donna. You see, she does something else as well. And I want you to think about this. Somebody whose job is catching the bad guys, helping them go to jail. She is a volunteer in a Methodist ministry we have called Exodus House. It's part of our criminal justice and mercy ministries, or what some people call prison ministries. I don't like that term because prison ministry says you're going to be in prison the rest of your life. That's not what the ministry is about. It's about helping people get out of prison and lead a good life. And so she works at Exodus House as a volunteer. And Exodus House is in Oklahoma City. We bought an apartment building. You guys help pay for it when you put your little money in the basket. We bought an apartment building, and when people are coming out of prison, they go there to live. And we love them, and we support them, and we teach them how to work, and how to do job interviews, and, and we furnish the apartments so that when they finally graduate from the program, they can take everything in their apartment, go out and start the world, and have a new life, a, a really repentant life. And my friend Donna, is one of those people that gives them that new life. These are people who, whose own families don't want to know about them anymore, whose mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters have rejected. And my friend, the other volunteers there, love them and care about them. Walk the walk they're walking and help them start life over. 
That's all Jesus was saying. That's all he meant when he told this story. Read it a hundred times. It always comes out in the same place. Find that lost lamb. Know that you're a lost lamb. That you're no better or worse than they are. Walk with them. Make the journey. That's the rule of one. And this is the word of God in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. What I didn't say is God gives us extraordinary power to change the world. He really does. And so today when we invite you to come and respond to the love of Jesus Christ, the presence of Jesus in this service, I want you to know that whatever Jesus calls you to do, Jesus will give you the power to do it. He will bless you with extraordinary power. I'm not saying it'll be easy, but he'll give you that power and that strength to get it done. And he'll walk with you every step of the way because every lamb matters to Jesus. You matter to Jesus. Jesus loves you. Jesus claims you. You are his. Will you come as we stand and sing? congregation to be seated for just a moment and uh, Ben and Lindy and Addison are here this morning they come to us by transfer they also have a son in North Carolina because they are a military family they get to come by a special kind of transfer where they'll be members of this church and their home church I think that's very special in the Methodist Church that we can do that and Addison is a big 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 part of our youth group and she is currently going through confirmation so you'll see her back up here in just a few weeks when she is confirmed. 
if you all would face me for just a moment, will you, will you do all in your power to serve Jesus Christ with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? And will you serve this church with your love and your service? We're so glad to have you. I'm going to invite these wonderful lay people to come stand behind you. Some of the youth families are here and some others. And just lay hands on them. We're going to pray for them as, uh, as they make a, a deeper commitment in their faith life. Lord God, I give you thanks for this very beautiful family who have come here today. Just saying that while they're here in this place, in this time in their life, that they're going to serve you here and they're going to be faithful and hardworking servants for you. And we are so blessed as a church to have them in this time. Uh, we are so grateful for this opportunity, Lord, to minister to them while they're here. And then we'll bless them and hopefully send them back to their home church uh, when their military service is finished. We just pray, Lord, that you'll bless them and strengthen them, um, especially for Addison. Let, her, let this be a time when she experiences you in a profound way as she goes through confirmation. We thank you for this great church you receive in, in Christ's name. Amen. And I think, uh, Kevin, you have the response there for the congregation. Yeah, y'all stay there one more minute. Uh, <laughs> will you join me in the response? We give you thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our gifts, our gifts and our service and our witness that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So it's a partnership, it's a covenant. You made your vows, we made our vows to love and care for you. And we are so delighted to have you. If you'll go with this beautiful lady and her husband right here, they will give you a present. So I, I think that's a pretty good reason to go with them. You all may stand for the sending forth. Thank you so very, very much for worshiping with us today. Youth and Confirmation tonight at 5.30. Our Logos program on Wednesday night. And Wednesday at noon, don't forget, every Wednesday at noon during Lent, we have soup. <laughs> we also have wonderful devotional time as we're getting to know each of the people who stand at the foot of the cross when Christ is crucified. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing on Wednesdays at noon, and you are very welcome to come and be a part of it. Will you join me now in the sending forth? Christ meets us in our wilderness. You who have received now are sent to give. 